because he said with man it is impossible but with God all things everyone say all now think about your problem think about your conflict think about your pain think about your circumstance and now I want you to say all again all all Exodus 3.13 and Moses said unto God behold when I come unto the children of Israel and shall say unto them the God of your fathers hath sent me unto you and they shall say to me what is his name what shall I say unto them and God said unto Moses I am that I am and he said thus shalt thou say unto the children of Israel I am hath sent me unto you John chapter 1 verse 1 says in the beginning was the word the word was with God and the word was God and the same was in the beginning with God and verse 14 says in the word became flesh and dwelt among us and we beheld his glory as of the only begotten full of grace and truth I want to preach to us this morning on the subject what's in a name what's in a name would you pray with me just for a moment Lord we ask that your word would speak to us that it would challenge us that it would wow us that it would give us direction that it would lead us that it would mold and shape us that it would give us understanding you said the steps of a good man are ordered of the Lord would you let your word be a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Would you let it order us today? In the name of Jesus. Everyone say, what's in the name? name? You may be seated. It's been a lot of fun to... It seems like since we've had this pandemic, it seems that there's been just so many great messages, teaching, etc. online. And I was inspired by one of Brother Woodward's messages. He, he did a study on Psalm 119. I'm not teaching on that today, but something he said in there spurred me to go into the Word and, and continue to dig out even more. It's just, this Word is absolutely incredible. It's wonderful. It's powerful. It's awesome. It's deep. It's It's... It's just amazing, the Word of God. And if you'll get into it, I've been praying lately, Jesus, your Word has led me to truth, and, but give me a, a, a fresh desire and passion for your precious Word, because He is the Word made flesh. And so if I want to love Him more, I need to love His Word more. I don't want to just love His presence. I mean, that's kind of the feeling, that's the... That's the, uh, that's, the, that's the fleshly approach. That's what we feel from Him in His presence, His fullness of joy, yes. But it's the Word that leads us and describes who He is, etc. And, and so continue to pray for me as I try to convey what I found. It just kept unfolding and unfolding. And, unfo- and I'm like, oh my goodness, this thing's going to take four hours. So I'm going to whittle it down to three and just do my best. There is a, I saw in Brother Woodward's lesson, there's an inscription above Jesus on the cross. And a man by the name of Henry Tissot, he's a Hebrew expert, he discovered that it is mandatory grammatically in Hebrew to actually write Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews. With Hebrew letters, we get certain I don't know if you're ready to show that up there we get the Hebrew letters that go from right to left now and I want you all to read that I know one that probably could (laughs) but it's read from right to left these letters are equivalent to our Yeshua Ha Natsri Wamelech Ha Yehudim. When we when when we read that in getting 
Yet I've seen many times in the Latin, there were, it was Latin, Greek, and Hebrew above Jesus as he hung on the cross. And when we look at the Latin, it's I-N-R-I. That was an acronym for the Latin. But for the Hebrew, you get the next one at the bottom. You see, that is yad He vav He. That is what the inscription, when you do the acrostic of the name, you get yad He vav He. That is extremely important. You think, what is that? That is the consonants for the name of God, which is where we get Yahweh from. So above the name, above Jesus, when he was hanging there at that time, Jesus, the Jews saw the man who they put to death, who had claimed to be the Son of God by the name of God, the Tetragrammaton, which it's called, unpronounceable, engraved above his head. This is the reason why the Jews had such a hard time. It wasn't the Greeks that were jumping up and down, uh, mad at what was above his head. It wasn't, it wasn't the Romans that were jumping up and down. It was the Jews because they understood what it said. When they looked up at Jesus hanging on the cross above his head, said Jehovah. I don't know if that means anything to you, but it means a lot to me. The fact that it was stating the fact that Jesus was God in the flesh. I went further and did a bunch of study on this, and it's just, it's amazing what he was trying to communicate to mankind through all the things that he did and said. In John chapter 8, verse 28, Jesus said, when you have lifted up the Son of Man, then you will know that I am. What he was, yeah, that's what I said, wow. When you lift up the Son of Man, you will know that he is God in the flesh. When they lifted him up with that inscription above his head that said Jehovah, he said, when you lift me up, when you put me on the cross and I get lifted up, there will be, a, you, everyone will know that I am stating that I am. I am God. To raise him means the crucifixion. The I am alludes to the name that God revealed to Moses back in Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, which I read when he said, I am that I am. When they raised him up and they began to crucify him, it was above his head. It was for the, all the world to see. And he said, just wait. You may not believe it yet, but when they raise me up, everybody will see. And it will be written forever. No, don't put that there. Add some words to it. Take some words away from it. And Pilate said, what I have written, I have written. He said, it's not going to change. It's because all the world would see written in the book of John that it will be, I am that I am. And that's who was up on the cross. It does make a difference. Jesus said, if you don't realize who I am, you will die in your sins. Because you won't think it's sufficient to use the name of Jesus in baptism because you don't know what that name means. When you look even deeper in the Tetragrammaton, the Y-H-W-H, the Yad, Hey, Fav, Hey. It literally, when you look, I, I looked it up myself. I, everything that I'm telling you, I looked it up in multiple situations. I didn't take one man's word for it. I looked up, I have pictures on my phone of this actually being so. When you look it up, it literally, the, there are pictures that go with the, the alphabet of the Hebrew alphabet. There are pictures that go with it. And when you look at the Yod, it literally means arm with a hand. So it means hand. When you look at He, it means behold. When you look at, at the, the Vav, it means nail. There's a picture of a nail and then it's behold. So literally when God gave his name to Moses at the burning bush, he was saying, behold the hand, behold the nail. He said, my name has something to do with a hand and with a nail. He was giving him the story of salvation all the way back at Mount Horeb when he was saying, if you want to know who I am, it has something to do with a hand and with a nail. But let me show you something else that I found. This, this came to me when I was studying yesterday. John chapter 20, 
Thomas doubted who Jesus was. He doubted that he was raised from the dead. And Jesus shows up and he said, reach thither my finger and behold my hand. That comment startled Thomas. Behold my hand. He never touched him. He just looked. And when Jesus said, behold my hand and reach thither thy hand and thrust it into my side and be not faithless but believing. What was Thomas's response? When Jesus said, behold hand. Thomas just stopped and he fell at his, on his face and he said, my Lord and my God. Thomas said, I get it. When you said that, I realized that you aren't just a second person in the Trinity. You were God in the flesh hanging on that cross. And you just proved it to me when you said, behold my hand. Behold where the nails were. God. Just take a moment. Lord, you went to incredible extent to prove to mankind who you were. Within the name is called a sheen. Letter of the alphabet refers to a rock. It is in the same form found this out in the Hebrew and in Aramaic Syriac. This letter, sheen, it was used in both the Old Testament and in the New Testament. And as I was studying, God spoke to me. And he said, this letter, which represents me, was used both in the old and in the new. And when I looked it up, it's true. Jehovah and Yeshua, Jesus. Sheen is used in both, which means he is the same God of the Old Testament and in the New Testament. Je the Jehovah of the Old Testament is the Jesus of the New Testament. It's the same letter that is used for both. The Hebrew spelling Yeshua has the letter Sheen in it. It also stands for the Hebrew name of God, Shaddai. Have you ever heard that before? El Shaddai. Now because of this, something familiar to us, a Kohen priest forms the letter Sheen with his hands as he recites the priestly blessing. Would you show that slide? If you, can, if you see close enough, he's going like this, and he's putting the thumbs together. That is a Kohen priest as he raises that and blesses. Now, why is that so important? He's forming the letter Sheen with his hands. In fact, it was so holy that at the time they would actually have to cover up the hands because it meant so much to form that letter of God with their own hands. And in the mid 1960s, actor Leonard Nimoy, more, many of us know him as Spock, used a single handed version of this gesture to create the Vulcan hand salute for his character. On Star Trek, did Mr. Nimoy know something we didn't? Leonard Nimoy's parents were both. Ukrainian Jews. So him using that, he didn't want to give it all away, but he knew exactly what he was doing when he gave that sign. There's something in the name. There's something deeper in the name when they, when they do that. Most people can't even do that. I can't. <laughs> Must have Jewish in me. In 1 Corinthians chapter 10, the Bible says there was a rock that followed them through the wilderness, and that rock was Christ. The rock, sheen, the letter, it refers to the same thing. He's saying it was God that followed him, but the 1 Corinthians says it was Christ. The answer is, was it God or was it Christ? The answer is yes, it was. Luke chapter 19, saying, Blessed be the king that cometh in the name of the Lord. Peace in heaven and glory in the highest. And some of the Pharisees from among the multitude said unto him, Master, rebuke thy disciples. And he answered and said unto them, 
I tell you that if these should hold their peace, the stones would immediately cry out. I have thought about that so many times, and I'm thinking if we don't open our mouth and give Jesus praise, I mean, there's going to be a voice coming from rocks. Well, I found something that has answered that question for me. The word, first of all, is like a rock to us. It can crush the power of sin. That's how powerful the word is. It can provide stability to us. It can provide shelter amongst the rocks. It can provide a shield and a fortress. But the Lord is also called our rock, our shelter, our shield, and our fortress. And he reveals himself to us through his word. This word is also my rock and my shelter. It will keep us and it never changes. Sheen represents two Old Testament names of God. The first, as I mentioned, El Shaddai, which means all sufficient one. But it also means Shalom, Jehovah Shalom, our peace and our wholeness. The Jews have a mezuzah on their door. I have one myself. It has the letter Sheen on the front of it. Inside, inside it is the Shema, which has the letter Sheen. It has the, the scripture Deuteronomy 6.4. That Sheen is produced on the front of it. It is in the shape of a... It, it used to be the original shape was a W. And it says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord, He is one. And every time they would go in and out, they would kiss their hand and touch that mezuzah because it's so important to them, because it speaks to them. It represents God, because Deuteronomy 6, 9 says, Put this on the doorpost of their house. It amazes me that 2,000 years later or 3,000 years later, God said, we're going to take the blood of a lamb whose name is Yeshua. It has the letter Sheen in it. You're going to take his blood and you're going to put it upon the doorpost of your heart. And it's going to mean something so near and dear to you because of the letter that it represents. Sheen is actually seen in the very foundation of Jerusalem. Let's look at that. We see the next this is Jerusalem topographically. On the left is the Hinnom Valley. In the middle is the Tyropoian Valley. It's, it goes right along the Temple Mount, and the right is the Kidron Valley. When you look at this, it actually forms the letter Sheen. God said in Jerusalem in 2 Chronicles 7.16, For now I have chosen and sanctified this house, that my name may be there forever, and mine eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. This land of Jerusalem, God gave to them. He put his name inscribed in the mountains as valleys that go through. The right valley is the Kidron Valley. It was also called the Valley of the Shadow of Death because there is a shadow that is cast across it. It's amazing that God said, I'm going to put my name there, but I'm also going to have Jesus walk across the Kidron Valley into the Mount of Olives as he's praying, saying, Father, for... He, he he said, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. He walked across the valley of the shadow of death and he walked back in to the eastern gate, which is across the Kidron Valley. It's on the eastern side. And now the Muslims have that gate shut up because they don't want the Messiah to be able to come back and walk in. Let me tell you, there ain't no bricks going to stop our God. There's no mortar and rock going to stop him from getting back into the city that has his name. Yeah. Hallelujah. Deuteronomy 16, 2 says, Thou shalt therefore sacrifice the Passover unto the Lord thy God of the flock and the herd in the place which the Lord shall choose to place his name there. He prophesied that there would be a sacrifice, a Pesach, the Passover lamb would be sacrificed in the place where God chose to put his name. He also looked at us in the flesh and said, don't build your house on the sand. 
Build your house on the rock. Because when the storms of life come by, it needs to be built on the rock, on the sheen, because then any storm will not take you out. Don't build your house on the sands of this world that will go away with the first rainstorm, but build it upon the rock. Amazes me. These three valleys converge in a direct line at the bottom. When you look at those three Valleys, they come together. No, the one before, I'm sorry. It converges in a direct line with the springs. They call the springs of living water. From under the throne, as discussed in Ezekiel, those rivers flow. And it says in the end time that they will flow into the Dead Sea and they will make it alive. It's amazing what God did. Now go to that next one, please. I looked at these mountains, and it's amazing. There are three that are mentioned that are significant. Mount Ophel and Mount Zion and Mount Moriah are all within this great city. Mount Ophel is where the pool of Siloam was. It symbolizes cleansing, according to 2 Chronicles 27. Also, it's where Jesus, the Yeshua, healed the blind man in John chapter 9, verse 7. So Mount Ophel represents cleansing and healing and sight or understanding. Mount Zion, as you can see in the middle towards, in the, in the, in the left, I'm sorry, in the middle to the left, It's where David's tabernacle was set. In Obadiah chapter 1, verse 17, it says, But upon Mount Zion shall be deliverance, and there shall be holiness, and the house of Jacob shall possess their possessions. So in Mount Zion, it's representative of deliverance and representative of holiness. And then we move down to Mount Moriah. It's where the current temple sat. This symbolizes God's glory according to 2 Chronicles 3 and 2 Chronicles chapter 7. 2 Chronicles 3 says, Then Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem in Mount Moriah. And we find out when he was done building the temple in Mount Moriah, he offered the sacrifices. And the glory of God filled that temple to the extent where the priests were not able to minister because his glory was so thick. Now, just a little, a little bit of trivia. Moriah is 777 meters high. God's number of perfection and completeness is seven. I think it's also interesting that 777 added together is 21. 21 happens to be the number of sheen, the letter that is used to describe God. These three mountains together represent cleansing, healing, salvation, separation unto God, which is worship, and the power of the Holy Ghost, Ruach HaKodesh. That's what this means. His name engulfs the three mountains that represent healing and salvation and holiness and deliverance, and understanding. It's interesting to remember that when King David had conquered this area and settled it as his capital city, there's no way he would have known that that city was actually seated on top of the name of God. What does that mean? It was the place that God took him and told him, This is the place where I have put my name in 1 Kings chapter 11 and verse 36. What does that tell me? It tells me that obedience put David right in the middle of cleansing. Right in the middle of understanding. 
right in the middle of salvation, right in the middle of worship and holiness, and right in the middle of rivers of living water. All three mountains represent names for Yahweh. Ophel in the Hebrew, we sang about it today. My fortress, fortress, my strong tower. Our stronghold. The word Ophel in Hebrew means a hill to build, a wall to keep. It refers to the hill to the east of Zion, which was surrounded and fortified by a separate wall. The name Zion in Hebrew, it's Siun. It means the mark, the sign, the way mark, the guiding pillar. Ephesians chapter 1 verse 13 says that we are sealed with that or given a mark by that Holy Spirit of promise. And then we move to Moriah. Moriah means to see God or to be seen of God. Where Abraham was asked to sacrifice his only son Isaac, thousands of years later, the temple was constructed there on Moriah. It was also right there that Jesus was crucified. So God provided a lamb once again on Moriah. Yet Moriah means to see God. Remember when I opened this morning, he said, when you lift me up, you will know that I am God. He was on Mount Moriah, which means you shall see God. When he was lifted up, he was fulfilling the scripture and the name of Moriah that he gave and said, call this Moriah. It's because it's where they will see God and where they will be seen of God. My God. It's in Jesus Christ that Yeshua, Yeshua HaMashiach, that we saw God. John in first chapter 14, verse 9, said, when you have seen me, you have seen the Father. And it was in Jesus that we were seeing God face to face. Now, the Hasidic rabbis say that the sheen looks like a picture of a person in the proper position for prayer and worship. I know what the sheen looks like today, but the original sheen looked actually like a W. The middle represents the head, and the outer represents their raised hands. Would you show the next slide, please? When Moses was up on the hill, up on the mountain, overlooking the battle. I always wondered what that meant when he was lifting his hands. And the Bible says as his hands were lifted, they were winning the battle. And when he got tired, Aaron and Hur would come alongside and would lift his hands. <clears throat> I've heard it referred to as a sign of submission. When we submit unto God, yes, but there's far more. When he lifted his hands, he was literally in the sign of a W. It was the sheen that he was showing. And when he was lifting his hands, he was casting the shadow of the name of God over the people of Israel as they battled. And when he cast the shadow of the name, they won. And when he let go and only his head was high, God said, you're going to lose unless you give my name above all. You will win if you give your head, you will lose. I must lead. So he casted that shadow. And the Bible says in Psalms 20, verse 7, some trust in chariots and some in horses in humanity. But we will remember the name. We will remember the name of the Lord God. They're brought down and fallen, but we are risen and stand upright. Something happens when we recognize the name. Hold off on the next one, please. There is another 
I didn't read this one. God spoke this to me. As I was praying, he said, Moses isn't the only one that held his hands up. There was another one who held his hands up. Sin was to be nailed to the cross. Disease and sickness were before that that he took with him. And as he held his hands up, would you put the next slide up? As he held his hands up in the sign of a sheen, in the name of God, Jesus cast the shadow over the people. That's why he could say, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. As he lifted his hands, forgiveness began to flow. As he lifted his hands, healing began to flow. As he lifted his hands, deliverance began to flow. As he lifted his hands, understanding began to flow. So it wasn't just the inscription above his head that said, Jehovah God, Jesus of Nazareth, King of the Jews, Jehovah God. He was lifting his hands as a representation of the name of God. And he was saying, I have all power in heaven and in earth. And I take dominion over every disease and over every sin and over every addiction and over every problem that you have. <laughs> My God. In his death, his body cast a shadow on the people and on the earth, and the name of God was displayed. No wonder the earth shook. No wonder the sun went dark. Because as we have it, the light was already on the cross displaying itself. There was no need of a physical sun. The light was on the cross. We even have a Roman crying out, surely this was the son or flesh of God. The voice was declaring him to be the Messiah. The sheen was declaring him to be God in the flesh. The inscription above his head was declaring him to be God in the flesh. But I said all of that to say this. There is someone else that can display the name of God as well. You and me. With our raised hands, we invoke the name of God. When we speak, we invoke the name of God of God. When we go down in the water, we take on his name. In Acts twenty-two sixteen, it says, the original, it says, and the name that was called over you in baptism. When we are baptized and we say, Jesus, we are, we are invoking the name of God over that. And what it does is it goes back to Calvary and it grabs the power that was loosed at Calvary when God in flesh hung on that cross and said now your sins can be washed away in my name if you will invoke my name over them in baptism what would happen when a bunch of Jesus named people baptized in his name cast his name upon the battle with raised hands? What would happen if somebody would walk up here in just a few minutes and say, I have a disease in my body and one of us were to go in the name of Jesus. We invoke the name of God over them. Why is it that we feel, I don't know about you, but I know what happened to my good friend, Brother Gentleman. I know what happened to him before he even knew who Jesus was. Brother Yance was standing there preaching. And he said, I just wonder if there's anybody that would possibly have a need in their life. And Brother Gentleman raises his hand. And then he looked at, and he said, you know what? Why don't we just raise the other one too? 
And as soon as he did, tears began. Remember that? Tears began to come down. Why? Because even unknowingly, he was invoking the name of Almighty God in his life. He didn't even know what was going on, but he started to weep and cry. That's what happened to me. I began to lift my hands and I began to weep and cry. Why? Why is that so important? Because we're Pentecostal? No, it's because when we lift our hands to him, we are saying, I submit to you, but we are saying, Sheen. We are saying, Jehovah. We are saying, Yeshua. He has been given a name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, every knee shall bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and every tongue shall confess that Jesus is Jehovah, my God. Hallelujah. Would you remain standing? The Bible, I don't have time to read all the scriptures, but the Bible says we are delivered by the name. It says, neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It says, they beat them and whip them for preaching in that name. Why? Because when they would preach in the name of Jesus, they used the letter Sheen. That's what every time they heard that name, Sheen is within the name Yeshua which is the modern name of Jesus. The Bible says they went in there and they said, what is going on with this man? They said, I don't know. But by the name of Jesus, this man stands before you whole. He was saying that they are healed by that name. He used the name. He didn't say, I don't know. You know, God gave us power. We just laid hands and they were healed. He said, no, by the name of that holy child, Jesus, doth this man stand before you whole. He said, it has to do in the name. You don't think the name makes any difference? The name is all power in heaven and earth. It's given in the name. And he goes further and he says, whatsoever you do in word or in deed, do it all. In the name of the Lord Jesus. Would you mind lifting your hands just for a moment? Close your eyes for a moment. And as you do, you are forming the name of God. I invoke it upon every problem in my life. Oh, oh, come on, let it settle in. I'm not just being Pentecostal. I'm not just following protocol. But I physically and willingly am forming the name of God which takes precedence over every disease over every addiction over every sin over every shackle over every chain over every pain over every religion there is one name that has been inscribed in the hills and mountains of jerusalem and he said i will declare my name to the generations it is jesus it is jesus it is jesus it is jesus, it is jesus. these altars are open in Psalm 63. So I will bless you as long as I live. In your name, I will lift up my hands. In your, how do you lift up hands in his name? It's like this. I am lifting up my hands in his, oh God. I feel the Holy Ghost today presence of Jesus is so strong in this place because we are truly honoring his name. I desire then that in every place men should pray lifting holy hands. Why? Because if we lift hands that are filthy in sin, we are disgracing his name. But if we come and we pray and say, Lord, forgive me, I pray that you'd forgive me then we can lift 
holy hands that form the letter of his name. And we can call upon all power in heaven and in earth. Let us lift up our hearts and hands to God in heaven. Lamentations. And lastly, Ezra chapter 9. My God, seeing a vision of his hands. God. Could we lift our hands? My God. Hodo Shanta. Come on, you are for me. Satan sees that. Isn't it a sign of submission? Didn't God say, submit unto God and resist the devil and he will flee? When we submit unto God, the enemy has to retreat. Come on. We're lifting our hands. There's nothing that has a hold of you. There is no conflict in your life that is greater. Greater is he. Come on. That it's within you. It's within you. The name of God is upon us and within us. Come on, if you'll come up here and lift your hands in submission and respect unto his name, every disease. Come on, there's some miracles that are about to happen because as in the pool of Siloam, there is salvation, there is cleansing, there is healing, there is sight in the name at awful in the pool of Siloam today. Come on, miracles are about to happen. Lifting up holy hands in his name. In his name. Come on, call upon his name. Jesus. 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 It's all in your name. It's all in the name of Jesus. Come on, let's begin to pray. Call upon that name. Lift your hands unto him and call upon that name. Jesus. Jesus. You have put your name here. Come on, that's it. Somebody's beginning to believe it. His name is here. Didn't he say we are people of a name? We don't deny his name. Come on, it's all through. It's all through the Old and New Testament. Don't deny my name. Don't deny it. But show it to me. Show this world my name. Oh, Jesus. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Every disease must bow. Every addiction must bow. Every doubt must bow. Every false religion must bow. Oh, Lord, I pray that you would deliver today in the name of Jesus. Pray in the name of Jesus. Worship in the name of Jesus. Repent in the name of Jesus. Be baptized in the name of Jesus. Oh, that name that was called over you in baptism. Oh Lord, we worship you. Let's begin to worship him.